This will once again need to be a two-part short take because of the time limit that I've set for each episode. With the title short take, they need to be, you know, short. And I can't cram all that needs to be said for this subject into the time that I've set for each episode. I want to say starting out that I'm going to end part two by saying something that would sound shocking, disturbing even, if not for the case that I'll build first. If I were to say it now, many no doubt would be shocked and might be tempted to bail. But once I've built the case for it, I trust that you're going to see the logic and agree it's a sound conclusion to the argument before, which begins now. Those who've watched previous episodes of Short Takes know that I posit two main worldviews vying with each other for dominance in modern Western society. A biblical, often referred to as the Judeo-Christian worldview, and a secular worldview. Now, there are, of course, many more worldviews around the globe. But these are the two that have battled for dominance over contemporary Western society for about the last century. While it's difficult to set a definitive date, the Judeo-Christian worldview that gave birth to Western civilization, shaping Europe and the New World for hundreds of years, that worldview gave way to that ideological juggernaut of the Enlightenment known as secularism in the 1960s. And it's not difficult to understand why secularism emerged from where it had been sequestered in the sedate, darkened halls of academia to challenge the bastion of Christendom at that moment in history. Two world wars had bloodied and muddied the very fields where Christendom claimed to have reached its zenith, while another war in Southeast Asia seemed to many as little more than a place for the military-industrial complex to grab more tax dollars. Then those in the seats of power they claimed had been authorized by the Judeo-Christian tradition fell to scandals left and right. Time seemed ripe for revolution. While some of that revolution played out in riots and protests, it proceeded mainly, and far more importantly, in a shift in a way a large swath of people thought about the world and their place in it. Maybe the most significant shift was this. People moved from drawing their sense of purpose and meaning from outside themselves to their personal attainment of happiness. Happiness became an end in itself, rather than a reward for achieving something worthwhile, something that made the world a better place. Now, to be sure, the ideological preparation for that shift had been going on for decades, most notably since the popularization of a philosophy known as existentialism. While it was mostly scattered intellectuals who embraced existentialism in the decades leading up to the 1960s, these early adopters were regarded by their traditionally-minded peers as avant-garde at best and dangerously self-centered at worst. But just as an epidemic spreads slowly at first and then reaches a point in transmission where it bends the curve to rise exponentially, the 60s saw the infection of secularism attack its immune-compromised host. Europe fell first, and then that cultural shaping behemoth, the United States. The 1970s and 80s saw what was called the culture wars, when secularism vied with Judeo-Christianity for the heart and soul of society. Secularism had already pretty much won the Western mind. All that was needed for its ultimate triumph was for the older generation to shuffle off the stage, taking its romantic attachment to the past with it. By the second decade of the 21st century, that was done. By the third decade, the culture war was over. Secularism won, and the roles have now reversed. Now it's diehard theists who are deemed subversive. Those who tenaciously cling to a biblical worldview are regarded by narrow-minded secularists as radicals who threaten the secular status quo. Secularists think that they've escaped religion for the free, sunlit fields of rationalism. They haven't. They've just traded one religion for another. Make no mistake, secularism is a religion by any measure of what a religion is. It's a belief system that explains where we came from, why we're here, where we're going. It answers that supreme question, who am I? It endeavors to be the answer to everything, making sense of all that is. Just because it removes God as a necessary part of reality doesn't make it any less a religion. Secularism is a non-theistic religion. Well, Christianity, of course, is a theistic religion. It's not just me saying that. 
many have recognized the religious nature of secularism. The 1952 Zorach v. Claussen case saw the United States Supreme Court declaring secularism a religion. Now, let me be precise. The court said that secular humanism is a religion. The justices weren't merely musing philosophically. They were dealing with a subject legally. As the religion of secularism has supplanted a biblical worldview, the consequences have been dramatic. Human beings are no longer regarded as image bearers of God, whose potential is realized in their apprehension of a unique, individual, divinely ordained mission. No, in the secular system, human beings are merely a replicating sack of chemical stew, nothing but an odd combination of atoms and molecules. In secularism, human beings were not created by a benevolent God to enjoy an eternity of intimacy with Him, who is the source of all good. They're just cosmic dust that managed to congeal into seeming self-awareness for what turns out to be no more than a brief burp in the space-matter-time continuum. Humans pop into existence, raise their fist toward the sky in defiance of nothing, and then they're gone. That is secularism's message no matter how much hopeful secularists may deny it. The hard-headed variety, though inordinately rare, admit it. But that doesn't sell books, make movies, nor music that anyone wants to listen to, and so they get no press. Only hopeful secularists do, though their religion is contradictory. These hopeful secularists say that we came from nothing, we're going to nothing, but in between we achieve supreme dignity and worth. What a pile of empty candy wrappers. In part two, we will dismantle the absurdity of secularism, showing how it's a self-defeating religion. We'll end with a proposition that ought to dispense with at least one aspect of secularism once and for all. <laughs>